In Thailand's southern islands live the Mokan, once nomadic seafarers who've gone largely unnoticed by the world for hundreds of years. They have a rich oral history of songs and stories, which helped them survive the 2004 Asian tsunami. The legend is called Laboon, which has been told from generation to generation. It is about the seven tides. It has been told many times, up until my generation. But today, they fight an even greater battle for survival. This time, against the modern world. I'm Pailin Waddell. On this edition of 101 East, we dive into the world of the Mokans and ask, are they on the brink of cultural extinction? The Mokan have no word for worry and don't keep track of time the way many of us do, in minutes and hours. There's no written language. Knowledge is passed down from one generation to another through storytelling. They live off the water, able to hold their breath while diving to great depths, and prefer to flee than fight when faced with conflict. Many share a last name, Glatale, which means the brave of the sea. When you dive, you do not think of anything. You let yourself descend deep into the ocean and allow your body to flow along with the underwater currents. For centuries, Mokans were nomadic, roaming the Anuman Sea around Thailand and Myanmar. Today, about 5,000 are left in Thailand. On Koh Surin is one of the last stands of traditional Mokan. Here, children still speak fluent Mokan, and elders still tell their old tales. Ngoi Glatale lives here with his family. He remembers the day when everything changed. We had just finished a meal and were planning to go to another bay to find forest goods, such as bamboo or honey. But just as we were about to get on the boat, the tide receded. It was the day after Christmas in 2004. A powerful earthquake off the coast of Sumatra triggered a massive tsunami that destroyed everything in its path. A quarter of a million people perished across the region. Thailand's southern coast lay in ruins. On the Surin Islands, elders saw the receding waters and recalled their ancient tales. Their warnings to flee saved everyone in their community. We asked the elders if this was a sign from our legends. They told us to hike to the top of the mountains for our own safety. Five to ten minutes later, a huge wave came, crashing into the bay. Boom! All at once. Their survival tales spread. Suddenly, the reclusive Mokan were thrown into the spotlight. Millions of dollars in aid flowed in. Museums, hospitals and schools quickly sprung up. But this sudden injection of modernity brought both promise and peril. Their lives were changed forever. After the wave, Thailand's national park moved Mokan from separate islands into one big village. Today, 200 people live here. They've become a popular tourist attraction. I meet with Gongki at Tem Tam Nan, head of the Koh Surin National Park. So that it's easy for us to help them, for us to really take care of them. We've arranged this special area for them in Bombay. 
which we've allowed them to stay and live in, this two-acre area, so we can take care of them, especially to prevent them catching diseases. But the Mokan are not happy with their new home. It has become overcrowded with people. Also, now that we are here, we can't move around, so the ecosystem around this bay has been degraded. The park insists that regulations are necessary. Because these days the outside world has come to the Mokum people, the Mokum have TVs and are seeing things from the outside world. They become regular people, like us. They might have some of the same desires as we have. If we don't take control of this, the Mokum culture could disappear. How are you working to preserve their culture? The park has allocated a place for them to live. We've allowed them to fish in their traditional way, by using a harpoon or a fishing rod, to sustain themselves. These are things that we've allowed for them, so they don't violate park rules. For the Mokan, the regulations are both a blessing and a curse. The regulation is hurting them, but the fact that the islands were declared a national park is partly a factor that saved the Mokan because, you know, it limits access of the outsiders, of the fishers, of the, the outsiders who come and take the, the benefit of the island. Researcher Narumon Arunotai is one of the few outsiders who has lived with the Mokan. Spending the last two decades learning their language and their sustainable way of life. If there's some compromise, you know, if the Mokan, there's a quota of foraging for a certain sea animal and then cutting some wood to, to preserve their culture, then, you know, it would bring a life and it would bring pride to the Mokan as well as uh, making, making them a partner in conservation. Before they use this for make cow or make a boat, Today, the Mokan knowledge is used mostly to entertain tourists on guided walks. I'm here with Ngai, who is showing us some of the traditional plants and herbs used in Mokan culture. But uh, this area is now a national park, so they can no longer use these plants as part of their daily life. Traditionally, the Mokans would cut down this tree and smash it. We would then use the foam as shampoo or laundry detergent. After the nature walk, Ngoi takes me to the beach. He tells me Mokans used to live on boats during the dry season and took shelter on land during the monsoon. I was born in a boat similar to this. This boat is put on display for tourists. In the past, they used to divide the vessel to cater to different needs. This part of the boat would store bottles of water and other items, such as the anchor, because there is a storage place inside the boat. The boats are known as kabangs. Many Mokan believe this is the last one still being used in Thailand today. To this day, we still use boats, but ever since the establishment of the national park, we are not allowed to cut down the trees to make a boat. We have only one vessel left in the entire village. In the future, I think it will completely disappear. The kabang is not the only thing that is disappearing from Mokan culture. As the older generation passes, fewer stories are told to the young. Stories such as the ones that saved them from the tsunami. I'm scared. The stories are real. They are things that people have experienced, and they pass the lessons through these stories. If there is no one to tell these stories, then there's a possibility the future generation will not be prepared for what is to come. Ngoi's sister, Wilai Sani, is the first Mokan on the island to get a college degree. She teaches in the island's only school. As the children show me their drawings, it's clear how much their lives are still tied to the ocean. But change is afoot. Wilai Sani is required to teach in Thai, leaving Mokan culture and language as something taught by parents at home. God.
Our traditions are becoming extinct, our elders are beginning to fade, and the younger generation are unable to pass on our traditions. Over the years, some Moken have scattered, moving from islands to the mainland. But once a year, Mokens come together from across Thailand to celebrate the Beach Sleep Festival. This has been a tradition for generations. Mokens have been coming here to this very beach at the same time every year to reconnect with an old way of life. But many Mokens feel that these traditions are dying out. If you made a wish or a request during the year and it was fulfilled, you will come here to sleep. Mokan people come from Patong, Rawai, Kosile, Luktio, and Satun. This is an ancient place, an important place. So everyone comes here. They come here to fulfill their promises. Rituals are held to contact the spirits of their ancestors. In this ceremony, a man is possessed by his Mokan forefathers, conjured to protect the new generation. He's being possessed by his grandfather and great-grandfather. That's three people now. Klong Saman is a shaman and my guide at the festival. The next person who has the ability to be possessed will take over this ceremony down the line. Sixteen-year-old Silapon Nawarak is here with her friends. She says her favorite part of the beach sleep is the traditional singing and dancing. But when it is her turn to perform, she is a little out of practice. <laughs> Nearby, the Moken are dancing to a different tune. This one, much more popular than the other. At dawn, to mark the end of the festival, elders throw spears towards a rock in the ocean, casting away their worries. Back in Silapon's village on the mainland, I ask her and her friends about the future of Mokan culture. <laughs> The girls tell me modern life takes over, and the further they are from their community, the harder it is to preserve their heritage. They also tell me being Mokan makes it difficult to fit in. In a nearby village, I meet a Mokan elder. In the old days, we say, we cannot stay in one place. We want freedom. It's better to keep on moving, so we can see new things always. And that's how we are till this day. Hong Glatley is the curator at the Mogan Museum on the mainland. The museum was funded by donations after the tsunami. Since the tsunami, I've received many good things and also many bad things. 
The good things include a new house, a shelter built using our own labor. I have a TV now and a motorbike. I was introduced to and befriended a lot of people. I got to know Thais, foreigners, other ethnic minorities. Those are the good things. Children now have education and are able to lift themselves up in society. The museum was built on the site of a small shrine, where locals left tokens or artifacts for ancestors. Everything was washed away by the tsunami. All that's left is in this room. But Hong says he's not worried about losing objects. It's the freedom to use the land and sea, to fish or dive for clams that he longs for. Hong shows me where his community used to dock boats. Today, the land is privately owned and off-limits. When the tsunami happened, development came very quickly. I thought when the tsunami came, people would be afraid to build here. But in fact, the desire to build here has been huge. The resources that Mokens rely on have all disappeared. The rights we want aren't about building a hotel or buying hundreds of plots of land, not those things. But the rights we want are for Mokens to live the way we traditionally live. Can they give us that? I travel 100 kilometers south to the island of Phuket, Thailand's biggest tourist destination. 14 million tourists will visit the island this year. Prices for beachfront property have skyrocketed. It is also the site of an intense legal battle. On one side is the Rawai beachside community, a mix of Mokans and other sea tribes who say they've lived on the land for hundreds of years. On the other are legal deed owners who want them out. The government brought in a forensic unit to dig up old graves and investigate the Mokans' claim to ancestral land. The results have not been publicly announced. Sanit is a community leader supporting residents through the legal process. The resident here was unaware of the disputes and was also not aware of the subpoena from court. She hasn't even seen it. She can't even read and write. This is also another house that lost without knowing. It belongs to Kai. It's the same deal. He never received the subpoena. From here on, almost every home has been sued. Not every house, but almost. This is one here, here's another, and down there, there's another three. Altogether, about 35 homes have been sued. We've been fighting since 2009. It's 2014 now, so it's been five years. If you ask me if we're tired, yes, but it's for our children. Mokan people don't really know how to fight. We don't know the law or the books. So we have to use our instincts and our beliefs to guide us in the right direction. The community here in Rawai has no legal rights to their land. That means access to basic amenities like electricity, running water and sewer lines is a big problem. Sengat Hatwari lives here with his wife's family, who has been sued for illegal squatting. They lost their case without even knowing they'd been prosecuted and are now appealing. To support their mounting legal costs, he works as a spear fisherman. Now the money we get from fishing also has to go towards fighting cases, and it puts a strain on us all. I'm just completely speechless and don't know what to do. But as commercial trawlers and fishing boats deplete the oceans of fish, small-scale fishermen like Sengat have had to take more risks to fill the same quota. We go deeper and it's more dangerous. We go down longer and that's also more dangerous. He uses a rubber hose that supplies oxygen through an air compressor to help him stay underwater longer.
If you go under for more than three hours, you'll get decompression sickness. If something goes wrong on the boat with the tube, suction will occur and your eyes will pop out. At least 11 people from his community have died from diving. Sangat fears he could be next. Businessman Biawat Sangiam Gun is one of the deed owners suing residents in Rawai. He bought the land from a bank in 2008 for a quarter of a million dollars. It is now worth six times that amount. There are 20 homes on his plot, and he says he plans to sue everyone claiming rights to it. Seven cases have already gone to trial. He hasn't lost one yet. They want rights, but I'm holding the papers that say I own the land. That's why it's a problem. 3,200 square meters are mine. One person wants this patch, another person wants that patch. It doesn't work that way. And why can't you use the land now? When I went to survey the area and measure it, I was chased out. Many times, in fact. The cement I stored there was also destroyed. He says he didn't know about the people on the property until after he bought it. Before I bought it, I didn't realize there were so many living there. I just assumed they were living in the surrounding areas. I don't think swing is a good thing. It's better to come to a conclusion or compromise. We are both wasting time. But if you're talking rights, well, we need to keep our rights too. So it's inevitable. We have to sue. Along with the fight for land, the Mokins' transformation from nomadic seafarers to land dwellers have brought many new struggles. There's this feeling of comparison uh, that compared to the other people, they are poor, they have a smaller house, they uh, don't have money, you know, clothing, whatever. This comparison makes them feel worse off than the other population. And I think that's one of the reasons why they would like to forget who they are. People call the Rawai community Thai Mai, or New Thais, because its residents have recently received Thai citizenship. But it is also a name that erases their Mokan identity. Until the Office of Ethnic Affairs was created in 2007, there was no government body responsible for Mokan welfare. Seven years on, a plan that would tackle many of their problems is still awaiting cabinet approval. I meet with Som Kit Som Si, the deputy director of the Ethnic Affairs Office. Today, we don't have the budget because the strategy hasn't been approved by the cabinet. We cannot set aside the budget. We have to use funding available within the ministry but we do especially look after our ethnic minorities. They were a group that we didn't use to look after, but today we give them special attention. Will the Mokan way of life disappear on your watch? I've been working with the Hill Tribe minorities for 36 years and have always been doing this type of work. So as long as I'm still alive in this world, I will always be looking after this issue. Not just Mokans, all groups. But for Mokans like Hong, the museum curator, much has already been lost. He shows me his ancestral burial ground. This used to be a cemetery for Mokan people, and I think my mother is buried here as well. My father told me her body is here. We came here and tended to it once. As time passed and development came, a road appeared. So when I want to conduct a ceremony in honor of my mother, I don't know where to do it. It's all road now. I'm not sure what else to say. My mother is under this road. The Mokan are torn between two worlds. One forged from centuries at sea. Another that is globalized and money-driven. And the battle between these two worlds is claiming their rights and even their lives. Like many isolated cultures around the world, 
they're being swallowed by change. The tsunami was one of the biggest natural disasters Thailand has seen. But for the Moken, a much stronger threat is modernity, washing away their identity day by day. And this time, there is nowhere to flee. Mulan, ngọ lang tam nay in te na mat ada, pokon ka eo ni ada pa doi, pin up ni dok dok ni.